Well, we should probably begin and start talking about Dickens, since that's what Peggy says she is here for. And I assume that's what the rest of you are here for. Um, and I'm John Jordan, and this is our last session on Dombey and Son. And before we begin talking about Dombey, Courtney and I wanted to tell you and ask you uh, about the possibility of forming a branch of the Dickens Fellowship in connection with, uh, with the Dickens Project location in Santa Cruz and uh, our uh, Zoom meetings that have taken place during the past year. And we, uh, Courtney sent an email message to everyone who's on this list. I hope you have seen that that describes some of the benefits of uh, being a member of a Dickens <laughs> Fellowship. Uh, it is possible to be a member of more than one Dickens Fellowship. Um, the, uh, I am a member of the San Francisco uh, Dickens Fellowship and I will join the Santa Cruz Dickens Fellowship if and when it becomes a reality. So. One of the things that we would like to do just briefly at the beginning of, uh, of today's uh, meeting is to ask if there are people who are present here who would be interested in or willing to become members of a Dickens Fellowship that would be located in Santa Cruz. We already have a core of five or six people I know of who can, who can uh, who will join that fellowship. Uh, we need to have 20 people all together. And uh, the uh, cost of being a membership, being a member of, of a Dickens Fellowship is, is relatively small. We have to come up with dues to the uh, Dickens Fellowship in London, the, um, the sort of the, the mother church, so to speak. Um, and that's 35 pounds, Courtney, is that, am I remembering correctly? I think it's 30 pounds. 30, 30 pounds. Um, so we have to come up with the equivalent of, of that in dollars. If we have uh, 20 members or, or more, then the, the cost is, is minimal. It would be something like $10 a year. Is that uh, uh, $15 a year, something, something on that order? Um, and it does give you the right to, uh, the next time you're in London, to free entrance to the uh, Dickens Museum. Uh, and it also gives you the right to uh, a reduced price subscription to the journal that is published by the Dickens Fellowship, the Dickensian, which comes out three times a year. Um, so that's in addition to the... The, the membership. So um, if you are interested, if you would be willing to uh, be a member or if you would at least like to learn more about it and have a discussion separately with Courtney, um, it would be nice if you could indicate that in the chat function of your, uh, uh, of your Zoom bar at the bottom of your page, or you can write directly to Courtney and let her know that, that you are interested. So I, I hope we can generate enough interest. We began this book club, uh, the Pickwick Club book club, began as a uh, an in-person um, book club that met once a month in the Santa Cruz Public Library, and the public library will be available uh, again for in-person meetings once we have them. But we, our idea is that we would continue to have virtual meetings uh, as well as or in addition to the, um, uh, the in-person meetings. So uh, I, I think there, uh, I, I hope there will be a critical mass of people who are, uh, who are interested. And so I invite you again, if, you're, if you are interested to let Courtney know and um, uh, or you can do so by indicating in the chat function at the bottom of your, of your page. So uh, is there anything else, Courtney, that I should say that you want to say about the, the fellowship, the branch of the fellowship? 
Well, um, one of the advantages of, of becoming a, a branch is that it will allow us to, to connect with uh, more people and more scholars, um, and we can build our community and learn from one another. So um, the Dickens Fellowship has been around for over 100 years or nearly 100 years. So yeah. um, they, um, you know, they're a very well-respected organization, and I think that it would be just wonderful to be affiliated with them. Okay, thank you. Well, um, let's go ahead and talk about the last part of Dombey and Son. And um, I, I'll just remind you about a, a few things. Uh, I, I've mentioned that Dombey and Son before Dickens was, uh, an, it was really a, a breakthrough novel in many ways, particularly in his greater sense of organization. And the novel divides very neatly, it's, this is useful for purposes of teaching, into four parts. Um, the first part uh, you could say is the story of Paul and it concludes with the death of little Paul. The second quarter of the novel uh, begins uh, after the death of Paul and sends Mr. Dombey with his friend Major Bagstock uh, in search of a new wife. And he goes to Leamington Spa where he meets Edith uh, and uh, at the end of that uh, quarter of the novel, halfway through the novel, there's a wedding. So Mr. Dombey, it's the, the, the section of the novel that is uh, the courtship of Mr. Dombey. The uh, third section, uh, the third quarter of the novel, we could say is the marriage uh, of Mr. and Mrs. Dombey. And it concludes with the uh, flight of Florence, the chapter called The Thunderbolt, in which uh, Mr. Dombey learns that uh, his wife has abandoned him and run away with his assistant, uh, Mr. Carker, and uh, he encounters Florence on the night when he makes that discovery, and he, in, in one of the cruelest scenes in the novel, he beats his daughter. He strikes her on, on the chest, on the, on the breast, and drives her out of his home. And one of the things I think that's really remarkable, just sort of to pause there uh, for, for a moment, about Dombey and Son, is that it contains several extraordinary moments of violence. Um, one of those, the, the, the one that stands out to me uh, it is the moment when Edith uh, takes oh, no. her hand. I'm and getting says, sound. Am, am I audible? Yes, I'm, I'm audible, okay. Um, Carker, you may remember, kisses Edith's hand. And after he leaves, Edith takes that hand and strikes it on the marble mantel place piece of the room where she is. And um, it's, it's a surprising moment. It's a violent moment. It's, a, it's an act of violence that Edith commits against herself, against her own body. Um, the next moment of extraordinary violence is the one that I just mentioned when Mr. Dombey uh, strikes Florence and drives her from the house. And then the third moment of extraordinary violence in the novel is uh, the death of Carker when Carker is um, uh, run over by the express train. Uh, and that's in the fourth section of the novel that we're talking about today. So the fourth section, uh, I, I don't think it has, uh, I, I can't think of a, an easy name to give it. It's not the story of Paul, it's not the 
uh, courtship of Mr. Dombey. It's not the marriage of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dombey. It's the concluding section. And as a conclusion, it, um, it has many elements in it because it's a big novel, a long novel, and it has to bring together the various threads, the various plots. And uh, it, it does so, it seems to me, in a, in a way that raises many questions. Um, I think that Dombey and Son is a, is a very powerful novel. And I think that the concluding one quarter of the novel has many powerful moments in it. But it also has other moments that, to me, are, are less satisfying um, and that raise questions of, about what Dickens was doing and how well he was doing it. And so I, I, I'm really interested in your reactions to the ending of the novel. I guess I, I would say as, uh, as, a, as a generalization about the end of the novel. I think that there are moments that are really powerful. Um, one of them is the death of Carker, the, the flight of Carker from Dijon in France where he has met Edith uh, and uh, uh, he, he flees and, and there's a wonderful illustration that accompanies that and it concludes with the uh, dismemberment, the violent dismemberment of, of Carker. Um, another moment that I think is very powerful is uh, the scene, the, the confrontation scene uh, in Dijon when Edith and Carker meet. And that too has a, has a wonderful illustration. I'll, I'll show you some illustrations from the novel later on. Um, but there are other moments in the ending of the novel that at least I, I have questions about. And uh, one is the uh, sudden appearance and Im important appearance of a character, uh, Mr. Morphin, uh, who was uh, mentioned early, early, early in the novel as uh, the number, uh, the, the, uh, uh, as an assistant at Dombey and Son. He's an employee of Dombey and Son, and he's roughly at the same level of uh, importance as Carker. Carker is the manager. He seems to be the chief executive officer of, of Dombey and Son, if we use. Um, uh, and Mr. Morphin is mentioned as, uh, I, I'm not sure what title to give to him, but as the internal manager, the office manager, if you will, of, uh, of Dombey and Son. And he shows up as a visitor at the home of Harriet and John Carker, uh, who is uh, the brother of James Carker, and who uh, he has, he's, he, John Carker, is still employed at Dombey and Son, but he's in disgrace because he was discovered to have stolen money from Dombey and Son. So the, uh, Mr. Dombey's father kept him on. Uh, as an employee, but in disgrace so that he would be an example to other employees that they should not uh, do anything illegal with respect to the business. Um, but Mr. Morphin shows up as a visitor to the home of John and Harriet Carker, the uh, brother and sister pair. And then uh, at the end, uh, he's one of the instruments that helps to arrange the conclusion of the novel. So we, we have, we've had almost no uh, attention to Mr. Morphin, and, but he comes in almost from the, well, pretty much from the outside and ends up marrying uh, Harriet Carker. Uh, and in another um, surprise part of the plot at the end of the novel, it turns out that Mr. Dombey, of course, uh, has, has gone, his business has, has been a disaster uh, because he was never really a good businessman in the first place. And um, 
his assistant Carker, the CEO of the of the business, has uh, made uh, bad investments, and Mr. Uh, Dombey has not paid attention, and so the the business, f for those two reasons, Mr. Dombey's inattention to the business and the um, bad things that Carker has done, uh, it goes bankrupt. So Mr. Dombey is forced to uh, put his house and household goods up for auction. And um, eventually he leaves the, uh, the house himself, that house that has been one of the major um, locations in the novel and that is a symbol of Mr. Dombey's wealth and of his social standing and of his power in, in the world. And so Mr. Dombey uh, is in disgrace, uh, both because he's financially uh, disabled, uh, he's bankrupt, and also he has the disgrace, the social disgrace of um, having his wife uh, run away with uh, his assistant in the, in the business. So there's the uh, illustration that you may remember called Mr. Dombey and the World, in which everything seems to be looking at Mr. Dombey and he is uh, uh, ashamed, he is disgraced in the eyes of the world. His pride, which has been one of his principal um, uh, weaknesses and also a, a part of his standing in the world, has, uh, has, has turned into shame, has turned into disgrace. But that, that ending that relies on Mr. Morphin is a, a curious part of the, of the novel. But the, the other part of the novel, uh, uh, the, con the conclusion, well, there's one other minor character who, who shows up and has a, an important role. Uh, we've seen a little bit more of him, but that's, that's Cousin Phoenix. And Cousin Phoenix is another minor character who um, uh, assumes greater importance in resolving certain plot elements at the end of the novel. He becomes the patron of Edith Dombey now that she has left England and um, has uh, her, herself in disgrace because she is now considered an adulteress. Um, and uh, Cousin Phoenix assumes the position of her father, protector, patron. So, so there are these two minor characters who assume important roles in managing the conclusion of the novel. And, um, but the other character, the character who is the uh, most important figure in the ending of the novel is Florence. And we really need to talk about, about Florence's role uh, at the ending of the novel. And uh, uh, this for me uh, means that we need to go back just in thinking about the, uh, the ending of the third section of the novel, the third one quarter with the chapter called The Thunderbolt where Florence, where Mr. Dombey strikes her and she runs out of the street and into the street and he curses her. He says, uh, he sends her out into the street. Uh, and she, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about the way in which Dombey and Son has a, a pattern of substitutions. He strikes her, Mr. Dombey strikes her because she is the substitute for Edith. His violence, his anger is really directed at Edith but Florence is the person closest to hand. So she, at that point, becomes the substitute uh, for, for Edith and the victim of Mr. Dombey's wrath, which is directed against his wife who has, has uh, uh, eloped with, with Carker. And uh, the, the, the chapter ends with Florence thinking to herself that she had no father. She has no, no longer a father. She's, she's homeless. She is, child, uh, she is a child without parents, uh, without a father. 
and she runs into the freedom of the street. Um, but that's not where the third section ends. Uh, there's one final chapter in uh, the third section of the novel, and it's called The Flight of Florence. And Florence finds refuge with Captain Cuddle. Um, and that's an important turning point in, in the novel. I think that is, uh, there's another substitution there. Uh, Captain Cuddle becomes the substitute father for Florence, the father, the loving, kind, generous father that she has never had. And I think at that point, the novel takes a turn and that something happens with Florence, something happens with the character of Florence from that point on. Um, so I, I'm going to step back for just a second and uh, make a couple of generalizations uh, about, um, they're really sort of generalizations about uh, larger patterns in, in literature. And I think a pattern that's operating in Dombey and Son in particular. And the reference point that, that I take for this generalization is a poem that some of you may know by the American, 20th century American poet, woman poet, uh, Marianne Moore. And it's a poem called Poetry. And uh, it, uh, it has a wonderful metaphor that uh, Marianne Moore uses to uh, describe poetry. And she says, poetry, is imaginary gardens with real toads in them. So it's a lovely metaphor. Um, and uh, so hold that in your mind for a second. And then another generalization comes from the anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss. And Levi-Strauss was, uh, very influential 20th century French anthropologist who wrote about mythology, wrote about myth. And he, he talks about myth. He has a very simple formula that he then expands into great, much greater complexity. But he says that myths, the function of myth in culture is to examine contradictions in a culture and to provide imaginary resolutions to those contradictions. So I think those two statements, the uh, imaginary gardens with real toads in them, and the function of myth is to offer imaginary resolutions to real contradictions. I think they're, they're very similar statements. Um, they're similar in, in the following way that works of art, works of literature, works of culture, myth, poetry, novels, Dombey and Son, are imaginary structures. And they tell stories. Myths are structured as stories, as, as narratives. And their, their subject matter is real toads or real contradictions in the world. And works of literature often attempt to provide imaginary gardens that contain the real toads. They, they offer imaginary resolutions to real conflicts. And I think that's true of Dombey and Son. That Dombey and Son, the greatness of Dombey and Son is the real toads or the real contradictions in the world that it presents. And the conclusion to Dombey and Son is a series of imaginary resolutions to those real contradictions. What are the real toads? What are the real contradictions in the world of Dombey and Son? Um, I think we could, we could list them and we could say, and, and this is probably not a complete list, um, but industrialization, social class, capitalism, marriage, gender, 
parents and children. Um, uh, the list could could go on. Empire, race, uh, colonialism, the relationship between the military and uh, uh, international commerce. Um, those those I think are the issues that lie in the background of Dombey and Son. Those are the big issues, if you will. Those are the the, the, the points of contradiction, uh, the points of difficulty in this novel. And Dickens is to be greatly admired for raising these issues. The railroad is, is you know, that's industrialization, that's, that's progress with all of the both positive and destructive qualities. Remember the first introduction of the, of the railroad in the novel. Uh, it is. It represents progress, and it also destroys the the world of Stags's gardens that existed uh, before that. Um, uh, anyway, Dombey and Son is an investigation of uh, of England at the middle of the nineteenth century, of industrial capitalism, uh, of empire of all the things that made England the most important country in the world and the way in which those structures, uh, including the family and another contradiction to, mem to mention is patriarchy. I mean, this is a great novel in its analysis of, of patriarchy. Um, those are the, the real contradictions that this novel raises. And those are the things that contribute, I believe, to its greatness. Um, the conclusion seems to me uneven in its resolution of those contradictions. And that really shouldn't surprise us because we're still struggling today with many of the same contradictions in our world. And Dickens is to be admired for his willingness to confront those issues. How does he resolve them? He resolves them by creating an imaginary garden to hold them. And I think parts of his resolution are more successful than others. I think his resolution to the question of the marriage of Mr. Dombey is very successful, I think two of the best parts of the conclusion of this novel are the scene of confrontation between Edith and Carker in France, in Dijon, when it turns out that Edith has run away with him, leading him to believe that she is willing to enter into an adulterous relationship with him, to become his mistress, to live with him as his wife, though she still remain, would remain married to Mr. Dombey. Um, but she refuses to enter into that relationship. And we have the, the wonderful illustration of the standoff between Edith and, uh, and Carker, where she stands erect and powerful, and he sits uh, before her uh, no longer with his smiling teeth um, and vulnerable and defeated. And then the other part of that, the sequel to that, is uh, his flight uh, from the nemesis that he imagines is pursuing him in the form of Mr. Dombey. Um, we should talk about whether Mr. You know, what Mr. Dombey is doing uh, at, at that point. That, that's something that raises questions for me. How, how did Mr. Dombey suddenly become so adept as to be able to follow Carker to, uh, to France and track him down and, and um, pursue him? Uh, is that really the Mr. Dombey that we have known before this in, in the novel? Uh, or is that just uh, a, something that Carker is imagining? Um, or is it a little bit of, of both? Um, but anyway, th those two moments seem to me 
wonderfully powerful. And they are very satisfying to me as resolutions to uh, the contradiction of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the, uh, the, the marriage of Mr. Dombey and the uh, temptation uh, that uh, 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 Edith faces of running away with Carker and the foolish uh, belief on Carker's part that he has succeeded in, uh, in that attempt to get Edith to enter into uh, the relationship. Edith emerges for me from that scene as probably the most powerful figure in the novel. At, and, uh, and Carker's death seems to me uh, something inflicted upon him, uh, not so much by Mr. Dombey as by Carker's own uh, hubris, his own pride, his own uh, self-deception that he can take over the position of, uh, of husband, of, uh, of the, uh, the figure of patriarchy in relation to Edith. And so it's, it's not quite a suicide. I wouldn't call it a suicide, but I think he brings his destruction upon himself. Um, other parts of the conclusion to this novel seem to me less satisfying. Um, and I, I'm wondering what you think about this. And the key figure here in the resolution of the novel is Florence. Uh, so I, I, I'd like to pose that question for you, uh, both in a specific way and in a more general way about the ending to this novel. Um, there are lots of minor characters who show up at the end. Um, I've mentioned Morphin and Cousin Phoenix. Um, uh, there are other people, Miss Tox comes back, Polly Tootle comes back, um, uh, Toots it becomes a very interesting figure toward the end of the novel. Susan Nipper comes back. We, ha we have, um, you know, there, there are many marriages that occur <laughs> at the end of the, of the novel. And marriage is a frequent way in works of 19th century fiction to resolve things. So I think that in trying to find a resolution to the real contradictions that Dickens has explored in the world of 19th century England, that he relies on that very conventional uh, plot element, which is the marriage plot. Um, so we have multiple marriages at the end of, of of this uh, novel. Uh, the final illustration to the novel is an illustration entitled Another Wedding. And it's the, uh, uh, an illustration of the marriage of Bunsby with Mrs. Max Stinger. <laughs> what do you think about the marriage of Bunsby and, and uh, Mrs. Max Stinger as part of the resolution to this novel um, and of that illustration uh, as the concluding illustration to the novel. Uh, we have the marriage of Toots and Susan Nipper. We have the marriage of Mr. Feeder and, and Miss Blimber from Dr. Blimber's school. Uh, they're, they're just all of these marriages that are occurring all, all over the place. Um, so I, I, I I'm interested in what you think about uh, the way in which Dickens concludes this novel and particularly about Florence, because Florence of course also marries. Uh, we are hardly surprised uh, that it turns out Walter Gay did not drown um, when he was sent off to Barbados uh, by James Carker and Walter comes back and Walter and Florence marry. That's another, if you will, uh, resolution to the, uh, the problem of marriage. 
So I'll say one last thing and then turn, turn it open to you too. Um, and it's, it's another way of thinking about the structure of Dombey and Son. Um, and I, I think the two main threads of the novel, the two major divisions in, in the novel are uh, between the house of Dombey and the plot of Mr. Dombey and his marriage and Carker and the love triangle and Florence's position as the child who is manipulated in the unhappy marriage, um, manipulated by Mr. Dombey, manipulated by Carker. And then the other plot element in the novel is the uh, Captain Cuddle, uh, um, uh, Saul Gills, uh, and the wooden midshipman. That, that, those are the two homes, if you will, in the novel. And as a generalization, I, I think the first element is the grown-up plot in the novel. And the second one is a more, a, a less mature plot. It's, it's more of, of a fairy tale. It's more of a, uh, uh, of a romance. You could, you could almost say that the Dombey plot is the real plot of the novel and its resolution with the death of Carker and the confrontation between Edith and, and Carker in France, that that's the resolution to the grown up plot of the novel and that everything else that happens, uh, the minor characters who come, the multiple marriages are part of the romance plot, the, 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 the fantasy plot, the less, the immature plot of, of the novel. Um, and uh, that the novel, in a sense, has two conclusions. It has a, a realistic conclusion in France and with the destruction of Carker, and it has a romance ending which involves Florence and uh, Walter's marriage and their, their children, um, the, the happy ending, if you will. But Florence is key. Florence is the key to the resolution of the novel. And it's Florence who appears in both of these plots and who I, I think Dickens is trying to use to bring them together, to, to bring the, the plot of Mr. Dombey and the Dombey family and marriage and uh, parents and children together with the fairy tale plot that uh, is easier to resolve because it relies on conventional uh, tropes like, like marriage. So tell me what you think about, about Florence and about anything else that happens in the end of the novel. I, I've sort of given you an outline uh, to, in which to, to think about this, but um, I'm interested in knowing what you think. So raise your hand, Courtney will help me to uh, uh, um, address questions or listen to statements that you may have. Unmute yourself. We're not here. Phyllis, we still can't hear you. Um, hmm. Oh, oh. Did you hear, do you hear yes. it now? Yes, yes. Ah, okay. Something going on with my something. Anyway, um, thank you so much. That was, um, happens to kind of dovetail with some reading I've been doing um, after uh, the Pilgrim's Progress stuff I was doing on John Bunyan and got into um, the Carlisle um, element of Dickens, which is sort of the reality, the, 
the real toads, right? The, the industrialization and colonialism and, you know, filthy lucre. And then the sort of Bunyan fairy tale allegory side of things, which is in George MacDonald and, uh, and was starting to write fairy tales for children with real life settings, but fairy tale endings. And that helps explain some of the things that bothered me a little bit about some of this, which was kind of the, the Alice Edith pairing and, um, and then Edith versus Florence. And I kept thinking of Rose White and Rose Red, or why do we have these women who are sort of opposites of themselves, but also refractions of each other. Um, so that helps me explain understand why they're in the story. Um, one other element of this section that I really liked was the, the dismantling of the house and um, the physical dismantling of the house and then the characters, the, the servants, the below stairs uh, dismantling of, of the house and of society and all the um, assumptions that are obviously, they see everything and they see all the, hypocrisy and contradictions and yet adopt a lot of them in their own ways. And I just love those scenes. Um, it was, uh, anyway, so that's, that's it. <laughs> yeah, th th those are very good observations. Um, uh, the, the house, one of the minor themes in the house is the place of the servants in the house. Um, and that speaks directly to the question of social class, one of the principal contradictions that Dickens is dealing with. There are many aspects of social class in the novel that we should talk about. Um, there's a larger question of what I once called modernity. Uh, um, who are the figures of modernity in this novel and how does the novel come down with respect to what is modern and what is Old fashioned. Um, uh, Alice Marwood, what is Alice Marwood doing in, in this novel? Why does, why does she end up being a cousin of Peter? Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, you know, extraordinary, almost forced coincidences that are introduced uh, at the end. The, I, I liked very much the, what you said about the, the servants, that the servants see clearly the, the problems in the Dombey household. They have, they have an accurate perception and yet they adopt many of the same attitudes <laughs> and they participate in, uh, in the marriage plot. There's, there's a marriage plot between the housemaid and Mr. Tallinson, the, uh, the butler. So uh, you, you, you have a replication at the level of the servants of some of the things that are happening elsewhere in the plot. But um, anyway, so you make good observations and you raise points that we should investigate further. Okay, so we have a number on deck here. Um, I'm just going to list who they are and then I'll, I'll let Maura speak. So we have Maura, Glenna, uh, Maxine, David, and Wayne. So Maura, why don't you take it away? Okay, I just wanted to talk about the question of Florence and Florence to me is the lesson that Dombey had to learn in order to have a happy life. If he had ta taken her into consideration from the get-go, he would have had a better time. He would have been closer to his son. He would have had a chance with uh, Edith. He, he would have uh, been, a, she was a great, she's a tremendous judge of character. She, he would have understood that Carker was not a good person to have around. Um, and, and he just dismissed her all along. And it's not until he finally comes to understand her and love her that he's happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she, she in, in that quick <laughs> summary, thank you, of, um, of Florence's role in the book, uh, she is Mr. Dombey's blind spot from the beginning. And it's only after a reconciliation between father and daughter is achieved that um, 
some happiness can be saved from the wreckage of Mr. Dombey's previous life. And Mr. Dombey has been destroyed to a great extent. Everything that Dombey stood for has, has fallen, has collapsed. Um, but at the end, through Florence, through the mediation of Florence, a measure of happiness, we, we see him at the end as a loving grandfather. Um, and so through that reconciliation, a happy ending is achieved. And just one, one other thing is that in, in a sense, he's her blind spot as well, because she keeps thinking it's something that she's done to cause this and she's not seeing him for who he really is. She has more patience than anybody I know. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm I'm really interested in in further comments about Florence. So, but you've started us off very well, Glenna. Yeah, um, I try and be succinct because I have a bunch of things to say. First of all, John, what you said about the real toads in the imaginary garden was so useful because I felt a sense of um, incompleteness when I finished the novel, and you gave me a sense of why that might be the case. I also, before I talk about Florence, wanted to say about Mr. Morphin, isn't it, is it Nicholas Nickleby where there is a, uh, an employee of the firm that suddenly rides to the rescue? Um, so I think that that's an interesting plot device that Dickens has used that, you know, some relatively, um, you know, some person without a lot of personal power nonetheless plays this um this role um yes i think that florence is a really wonderful character because unlike some of dickens other female characters she does have agency she does show a lot of pluck on many occasions it is troubling that she just keeps blaming herself but i think from what i've read in you know i'm not a psychologist but I've read a fair amount about abused children. And I think this is not uncommon that children uh, take it onto themselves if a parent isn't adequately loving. Um, so I think Florence is a very successful character. The one thing, the one scene that you didn't mention that I did find kind of icky, well, before I talk about what I found icky, I thought the scene, I think the scene between good Mrs. Brown and Rob the Grinder, where she screws, I think that's a, ooh, is that ever a powerful scene? I mean, fairy tale, you know, all kinds of dimensions there. It's not exactly realistic, but it's powerfully written. But the scene- What, what results, she, excuse me, what, what is the result of that scene? Well, she can, she can uh, find out where uh, Carker and Edith have fled and and pass that on. So that's really the what leads to the death of Tar Carper, I would suppose. Okay, that's 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 very important, and it's it's true. I mean, what uh, we could say that the cause of Carker's death is the combination of Good Mrs. Brown and Alice Marwood. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the scene between Edith and Florence. I don't know, that just didn't ring true to me, uh, where, you know, the penitent, but not entirely penitent, Edith and Florence. I don't know, there was something about that scene that I just found, um, and again, from our modern eyes, it's hard to believe that over and over again, it's like, but it was never, I was never an adulteress. You've got to know that I was never an adulteress. Well, you know, you run off, you do all this, you do all that, isn't that enough? But somehow or other, you know, my, my virtue is intact, and that is going to be uh, material. Uh, I don't know, there's just something about that scene that seemed tinny to me. I'm, I'm very interested in that scene, and I want to hear what other people have to say about it. So, but good, good that you pinpoint it, because I think that's, it's, it's the crucial scene in the conclusion of the novel. Maxine? Oh, you have to unmute. Is that better? Yes. Um, I found the first three quarters of the novel brilliant, and the last quarter had a number of disappointments, as people have been 
leading to and the idea of showing the toads he did wonderfully the resolutions I didn't think were wonderful uh, specifically three I don't agree that the uh, death of Carker um, was satisfying in that I don't think there was nothing in his, his psychology that would predict that he would have a psychotic episode just because Edith didn't uh, uh, you know, want him want, want to be his uh, lover. Um, it's it's brilliantly written, but it's 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 uh, it's it just doesn't seem true to him. I think he, he's he's he doesn't love her particularly. He's not capable of love. He still has um, all the money, so he's done his enemy uh, Dombey in any way. I, I it just seems too hysterical to me. Um, secondly, the reversal of of um, Dombey's to go from complete disparagement of, of um, Florence to loving her. I, I don't think that's motivated. In my edition, there's a preface by Dickens where he says that that wasn't a change, that that was always implicit in the character of, of um, Dombey. But if so, I, I don't see it. I don't see it in the text. Um, and the third thing that I found very disappointing uh, was the end when Walter says he's going to establish a new Dombian son. I mean, through the book, the whole question of what is money has a potentially subversive quality to it. Um, uh, and you mentioned capitalism, industrialism. So the fact that he's going to just go back and make, uh, you know, he's going to be a nicer man than Dombey and so on, but, but that he hasn't, uh, he, he, it just, um, sort of negates the subversive power of the rest of the novel, I thought. Okay, uh, those, those are all excellent things to raise questions about. And the one, th I'll speak to the first one that you mentioned, because I think uh, it's, it's interesting to uh, cast Carker's state of mind as a, as a kind of nervous breakdown or a hysterical moment. Um, well, even he, psychotic. It's a psychotic, it's a psychotic moment. And yeah. I think the, the way that I would perhaps give a more um, accepting or, or plausible uh, way of thinking about that is that Carker, Carker's real fixation is not on Edith, it's on Dombey, right. and, and that, that Dombey as the image, if you think of Carker as the Oedipal son, as the son whose greatest wish is to take the place of the father, it's, it's not so much to have Edith as his possession, it's to be the father who possesses Edith, and that what causes his psychotic break is the vision or the fantasy of the father who is pursuing him, not the real father, not Mr. Dombey, not a, a real character, but something, a, a figure that exists in Carker's mind and that is chasing him. And I, I don't think Mr. Dombey has the um, capability of being a kind of detective who even with the information that he gets from uh, Mrs. Brown and Alice uh, to pursue Carker in the way that Carker thinks that there's a bloodhound on his, on his tracks. I think all of that is in Carker's mind and that Carker is demented or psychotic at that moment. He's no longer the Carker whom we saw, who, who speaks many languages and knows how to play every game and who is shrewd and totally in command. He's, he's completely lost command. He is the, the helpless little boy who is running away from the punitive father in his imagination. So that's, that's a slightly different way of thinking mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. But, but anyway, your other points are, are, uh, are also worth discussing. So let's, let's go on. Let's, let's hear what other people have to say. And okay. I'm very interested still in Florence. Uh, David, uh, then Wayne and Peggy. Okay. 
Um, everybody's been saying such good things, but I have in mind particularly links to what Phyllis said, but I want to talk about Florence from two different sides. On the one hand, in reading the last quarter of the book, I got increasingly irritated at her. And then it occurred to me that I kept thinking of, of uh, the character of patient Griselda. Uh, does that need explanation or? She's a little bit of that. in a story a in the Decameron, then the, the clerk's tale in the Canterbury Tales. And uh, this was, she was immensely popular as, as a literary figure up to the Elizabethan period when I, somebody, I think Thomas Decker, did a patient Griselda play. She's the poor girl who is taken out of mud and married to a lord on the, who makes her promise that he, she will always be cheerful and never complain about anything. And she has children and he takes the children away from her and she never complains. She puts up, you know, nowadays she would write a letter to a columnist saying, what should I do about this marriage? The columnist would say, get the hell out of there. But uh, there's this fascination with the long suffering woman and the, it continues. Uh, it's, it's one of the Victorian values in marriage for an awful lot of the, of the marriages and the, the novels is that the, it's the wife's duty to put up with whatever the husband chooses to do. Uh, but the other side of Florence is one, I think, uh, I think it was Glenna who said, uh, an abused child and reaction. And that led me to think, we all know that all through Dickens, there are abused children and that this is something is a subject to which he recurs. But I was thinking this time, there's also a fascination on his part with adults who were abused children and how they adjusted uh, what they've done in response. I think of Esther Summerson and Bleak House. I think of, uh, Oh, a central figure in Little Dorrit, who certainly had an abusive childhood. All these, and it's certainly possible to explain a lot of Florence by uh, her adaptation to this abusive upbringing and her decision that. It, she can't question her father, so it must be something she's done wrong. But that seems to me the least satisfactory part of the last quarter of the book. I should yield and let someone else have a turn. Okay. Wayne? Oh, yes. I thought that David's mention of the patient Griselda is excellent. I really find Florence's psychology very credible, but where there is a problem, again, is that she is not really convincing as part of the resolution of, of the novel. That is, she is so passive, one could almost say passive aggressive, that she, I, I guess I disagree with her agency. It's a, a kind of a negative agency waiting for people around her to change. And uh, I, I think that quality of her character contributes to some of the fizzling in the last quarter of the novel. I had another unrelated point 
when John mentioned the proliferation of characters, many of whom are introduced in the first quarter and have to be kind of knitted back into the plot in the last quarter. But it may have been Virginia Woolf who made the wicked comment that whenever Dickens was in trouble, he just threw another handful of characters on the fire. <laughs> but that's all I have. Um, I'll, I'll say just a couple of things. Uh, I, uh, I think Florence does have some agency, at least in one area, and it's that she is the one who proposes marriage to Walter instead of Walter proposing marriage to her. <laughs> Um, that's actually quite extraordinary in a Victorian novel. Uh, and um, uh, it, it has partly to do with class because Walter is of a lower social class than, than Florence um, and has to do with the fact that uh, Walter still thinks of himself in some ways as Mr. Dombey's employee uh, and for the uh, for the employee to marry the boss's daughter uh, is, um, you know, it's a, it's a little reminiscent of Carker and, and Edith. Um, uh, but the question of Florence's psychology is, I think, something that we need to still gnaw away at because I think there is a transformation in Florence. In some ways, Florence remains constant, remains the same. Um, she has been hungering for her father's love from the beginning. And after he is brought low by the circumstances of his financial ruin and the humiliation that he faces in the eyes of the world, like uh, uh, she, she um, I, I've sort of lost the thread of where I was was going with that. But any, anyway, um, uh, the, the, the novel cannot end without Edith coming back. Edith has to come back. Um, if Edith left Dijon after the confrontation scene with Carker and disappeared and we got only secondhand reports from uh, cousin Phoenix, that he was taking care of her and, uh, you know, that she never came back to England and um, lived in a kind of exile as a fallen woman, the novel would be even more weak in its ending. Um, so the important scene is the one uh, that Glenna mentioned, which is the scene where Florence and Edith meet at the end. And it's Cousin Phoenix who facilitates that. Again, the minor character who um, is instrumental in bringing about uh, that, that crucial scene. So that, that, that scene is one we need to talk more about. But let's take other, other responses. Peggy? So I have heard all of the Florence as an abused kid and that's why she does stuff commentary, which I understand and agree with somewhat. But the thing that didn't make any sense to me at all was the scene with her and her father where she is apologizing basically for having left because he hit her and treated her like terrible and all that. And why is she apologizing? It just, it just couldn't, fine, come back, have some kind of resolution and re reconciliation but to do it on the i on the basis that it's all florence's fault and she's bad and wrong somehow it just didn't work for me at all and i wondered what other people thought of it it's it's uh it, it just didn't work um i can see that she had wanted him to love her for her whole life and she had done whatever she could do and now he did, and so that's good. But she, you know, she took care of her brother. She learned all that Latin stuff for her brother. She has agency. She was doing everything she was doing to get her father to love her. And then all of a sudden 
she gets to realize that he's a brute and leaves and goes to people who do love her. And then she apologizes for herself. It, does it make any sense to anybody else? Okay, let's, let's hear from other people. Uh, Gary? Um, yes, uh, the Florence problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm gonna just say that I was reading the foreword to um, my Oxford edition of this novel, never having read the novel, I, re I read forewords and what have you, or the introductions later. And one of the comments that a scholar named David Walder spoke of is the, this preoccupation with time and memory that pervades this novel. And, and we had talked about that previously. It wasn't new to, the, to what I had thought about and what John, you had spoken of previously. But I think it's also tied into this sort of fairy tale quality of what happens with Florence from the time she's kidnapped by Mrs. Brown early on to the very end. And in many ways, you know, I've seen her as a character that doesn't change. She's kind of saintly as, you know, we've been saying. Um, the conversation that she has with, with Edith, I think, one of the things that I notice about that is, of course, Edith says to her what she says to, to, um, to Florence, as I remember it, is that I'm, I will be satisfied, in some way she says, I will be satisfied, if my memory serves me right, with your father loving you, or that satisfied with, you know, you'll never see me again, but that, that connection there that she has is an important one. She also, Florence also has had a child. She says that, you know, that that has changed her in, in understanding her father. And then finally, the comment that I love at the end, when I think, I forget who says it, is this Mrs. Tox, it's not Dombey and son, it's Dombey and daughter. And that's a very powerful comment. And it shows the strength of her as, as we come to the end of this, though. Um, I see some change in her, but, but I still see that, that fairy tale thing that's going on. So I'm curious to hear more. <laughs> and what, 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 John, you're getting at with that, because I, I, I love the mystery that's behind this and what, what's, what I'm going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else want to weigh in? Um, I see some hands. Uh, uh, David? Okay, quick point. Uh, the Victorians with children emphasized very strongly the seventh commandment, uh, honor thy parents, etc. The the author on whom I did my dissertation was particularly brought up this way. And she, all her long life, even when they were outdated, one of her less successful novels, to be polite about it, is called Nutty's Father. And Nutty is a nice girl whose father reappears in her life. He's lush. She gives up on having a life of her own in order to take care of him. And the author thinks this is exactly the way things ought to be. So that's why Florence apologizes to her father. It's, it's her duty as a daughter. Enough. Mm. Phyllis? Um, I just wanted to follow up on what Gary said and the last speaker said about Florence. She did get agency when, when she had had a child who she named after her brother and her father. And then she had a second child, a little girl. 
and named it Florence. So that Paul and Florence will be forever joined as siblings and maybe as some kind of Electra sort of echo to go along with the Oedipal echo that somehow she has joined herself to her father. Don't know. Anyway. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll chip in a little bit at this point. Um, and uh, what I'm about to say comes from, uh, I'm repeating ideas from Scar Alexander, which, uh, Sandy Welch. And he argues that Dombian Sun is a rewriting of King Lear and that Dickens had King Lear consciously in mind as he was writing the ending of Dombey and Son. Uh, you, you may know that until the 19th century, the ending that was used for King Lear was not a tragic ending in which um, Cordelia dies, uh, but one in which she lives and marries and is reconciled with her father. Uh, it was only uh, when uh, Dickens's friend, the actor Macready, um, uh, performed the original text of King Lear that Cordelia died on the stage. She lived in most other productions. So uh, according to this interpretation, uh, Dickens is rewriting the ending of King Lear in which there is a reconciliation between the tragic uh, figure of Mr. Dombey and his uh, faithful daughter who was the only daughter who, who loved him of the, the three daughters. There are no other daughters. Uh, so the parallel doesn't extend that far. Um, and in this reading, one of the things that Welsh suggests is that Dickens from the beginning had the idea that Dombey would undergo a conversion at the end, that Dombey would be ruined uh, and his ruin would lead him to the understanding, the, the realization that his greatest sin, his greatest mistake in life was not to recognize his daughter. And there, there uh, are, I mean, if we go back and think about Mr. Dombey, we, we can think about him as the figure of patriarchy, um, the abusive father, the uh, uh, sadistic husband who deliberately sends Carker uh, to be his go-between with in the difficult conversations with Edith because he knows that uh, uh, Edith dislikes Carker and it's a further insult to her to have to deal with, uh, with Carker's emissary. Um, and uh, in all those ways, Dombey is, I think, detestable and his behavior is detestable. But there are moments, there are little glimpses uh, when Paul dies, Dombey has a tear. Uh, Dom, Dombey is, in, in, at least in this reading, um, there are moments where we recognize or where we are meant to recognize that Dombey is not an evil person, that he's someone who has, whose emotional growth and capacity for love have been stunted. And that after he is brought low by the, um, the financial losses and the personal humiliation that he suffers, that he is then ready to accept love. And Florence has continued to love him all the time. So Florence comes to Dombey at a time where Dombey is now available to accept her love. 
and she has been constant. She has, you know, in a novel that is about change, uh, principally as embodied in the, the railroad, which is transforming and, and industrialization um, uh, more generally, but the railroad in particular is a great force for, for change that Florence has never changed. That Florence has been constant from the beginning. She's a version of the patient uh, Griselda, um, or she's a version of Shakespeare's Cordelia from, from King Lear. And um, this, this reading, I think, goes a certain way toward understanding what Dickens was trying to accomplish at the end. But it, for me, it's, it's not completely successful um, because it requires what I think is a, a change uh, in both Florence and in Dombey. I think Florence at the moment where he his, her father strikes her and she runs out into the street and experiences for the first time a freedom. I think she's she's someone who has been, um, if, if it's not too strong a word to use, but I think it's a theme in the novel. She's been a slave in that house. Um, she has been reduced to the, uh, the status not of child, but the child as, as servant, as slave. Susan Nipper, who is her double in the novel, her her, her her companion does stand up, does in a scene that we haven't discussed and haven't given enough weight to. She does stand up to Mr. Don. And as a result, she gets expelled from the house. And what Susan does is to speak for Florence. Susan, Susan is the, uh, the, the nipper. I mean, she's the one who has, who's carrying all of the anger that Florence should have. And, and Florence can't get access, except maybe briefly at that moment when, at, when he hits her, uh, she, she can't get access. But immediately from that point, uh, Florence, who has been growing up, who's been becoming more mature, who's studied, uh, done lessons with Paul, um, when uh, Mr. Dombey comes back from Leamington Spa, and sees Florence for the first time, he looks at her and almost doesn't recognize her. And the reason he doesn't recognize her uh, or almost doesn't recognize her is that she has passed through puberty. She's become a woman, she's grown up. Florence, Florence is becoming a woman. And if you look at the illustrations, if you track the illustrations of Florence from the earliest ones when she's a little girl to the one where she comes in and finds Mr. Dombey in his, um, in his room where he's been a prisoner. Uh, she, has, uh, she has matured, but in other ways, she has reversed, reverted to being a child, to being a little girl. And when she goes to Captain Cuddles and starts fixing tea and doing the shopping and, um, she, she no longer has the degree of independence or agency that she's really practicing to be a good daughter. So uh, in her relationship with Captain Cuddle, who's a, a good father, he's the replacement for the terrible father that she had, uh, she, she becomes a proper Victorian woman, um, an angel in the house, Whose, whose job is to um, obey the father. And for me, the scene with Edith, it, it really requires uh, at the end, Edith, as I said, has to come back into the novel. It, it would, the novel would be impoverished if we did not see uh, a final scene with Edith. But when Florence and Edith meet, in, in the first place, there, there, there's something very strange about how that scene is prepared. Um, Cousin Phoenix comes to the house and speaks with Walter. And Walter says, there's someone here who wants to see you, who wants you to go to London with him to beat someone. And Florence has no idea about who, who it could be. Uh, 
why doesn't she know? Why doesn't she realize that, you know, that's, that's who's waiting for her? Who's the important person in her life that is missing at that point? It's, it's Edith because she has been, <laughs> Edith has, been a, has been a mother to her. Uh, she calls Edith mama. Um, the loving relationship that is strongest in her life is the one with, with Edith. It's not the one with, uh, with her father because her father has never reciprocated. Um, but then she goes in and she meets with Edith. And the first word she says is mama. And think about what that means for Edith. Because Edith at this point has no one in her life who loves her and whom she loves, except Florence. And here is Florence who shows up and, and, uh, and calls her mama. So Edith is torn. E e e this, this is just a terribly poignant moment for, for Edith. Um, and Florence then says, are you ready to apologize to my father? And, and she starts saying, here's what you could say. I mean, you, you really have to go back and read that passage closely. Florence puts words in Edith's mouth. Here is the apology that you could make to my father. And she's, she uses the phrase duty to Papa and for me, this is just a terrible, painful moment because Florence is extorting from Edith a confession and an apology that Edith is not ready or willing to do. Um, and so Edith's, you have to read Edith's responses very carefully because Edith words her her responses to, to Florence very carefully. She says, in effect, you do not commit a I is a, you know, she doesn't say, I'll apologize to Mr. Um, uh, maintains her integrity. Edith does. Um, and Florence keeps pushing on her, pushing to get her to uh, achieve a reconciliation, not just to achieve a reconciliation, but to do it on Dombey's terms and on Florence's terms. So for me, at that point, Florence has become the Becky, who is forcing Edith to submit to the authority of the father to submit to patriarchy. And Edith won't do it. She says, I can be happy if Mr. Dombey loves his daughter. That's something that will please me. Um, but she will not apologize. She maintains her independent position. And it's, it's terrible because she, in effect, Florence is saying to her, you must choose. If you want my love, if you want me in your life, if mama, you must do as I ask of you because my duty is to papa. And it's very difficult for Edith to withstand that from the one person that she loves and, and holds most dear. Um, and I think it's difficult for her to do that. She makes a couple of small concessions in saying that she would be willing to um, agree to be pleased if Mr. Dombey loves Florence. Uh, but that's about as far as she's willing to go. So look at that scene again, look at it carefully and, and, and think of the awful predicament that uh, Edith is in at that point. So. We have a lot of 
Um, so I'm going to just read the list so everyone knows where they are. Um, so um, Kathleen, Robert, Tiger, Irene, Ted, Glenna, Karen, Maxine, Martha. I think that's everyone. So uh, Kathleen. Um, I read an introduction to one of Dickens' other books in which he uh, talked about the ending of Great Expectations and how his editors had persuaded him to change the ending because his, the reader is expected to have a, a happy ending. And so therefore, Pip in that story had to be reconciled with the young woman because the readers wouldn't stand for having it any other way. And when I first read the last part of this book, I thought, well, this is the same thing. Dickens is throwing a bone to his, the readers of this serial who have been with him all along and who now want their, their satisfying dessert of all manner of reconciliations taking place. But when I reread this scene with Florence and her father, at first I was offended by it because I thought, here's this woman who, this young woman who had a lot of possibility of taking a lot of her own when she was younger, when she, before her father um, suffered his humiliation. And now she's going to him and, and subordinating herself to him. But then I began to see both in that and in the scene with Edith, um, Florence is beginning to reverse the roles. She's beginning to be the one who proposes the course which the relationship will now take. It can, I agree, be read with, um, in the scene between Edith and, and uh, Florence, that uh, she's trying to force Florence into, a, into submitting to patriarchy. I agree with that. But I also see that Edith is trying to, is she's realizing that yes, she doesn't have to be just acted upon, she can act. And she says to her father, you know, she, she's the one who proposes that a reconciliation is possible and that, but the role will be in a way on her terms. He is now to be the benevolent grandfather and he's no longer to be the dominant one. I don't think she'd stand for him trying to dominate her family as well. So I saw a real, a real reversal there and, and a germ of, of Florence discovering her, her agency the power that she had within the limited sphere of a woman at that time and in that society. But she began to see that her role was relationships and managing relationships. And she was beginning to make tentative steps to do that. I thought the comparison with King Lear was interesting because there's a, a English folk tale called Why Fresh, Milk, Why Fresh Meat Loves Salt. And there's a German version of it too called Allerlei in which the, um, the father asks the daughter, asks one of his three daughters, how well do you love me? And each of them says something else. And the, the youngest daughter says, I love you like fresh meat loves salt. And he says, that's insulting. And he throws her out of the house. So she goes off to become a kitchen maid in a, a wealthy aristocratic family to which several years later, he is invited as a guest. And so as the kitchen maid, she is in charge of preparing the meat and she leaves out the seasoning. Mm -hmm. And when he eats this meat, he, he can't stomach it. He said, this has no flavor. And then he remembers her remark. I love you like fresh meat loves salt. Mm -hmm. And in a way I see that, I see Florence doing the same thing with her father. She's saying this, this is the core of a good relationship. And if you want a good relationship with me and with my children, with your grandchildren, this is the term on which it's going to have to occur. Um, that's, that's one of the best um, defenses of Florence's role at the end of this book that I have heard. And I, th I think what you say makes a lot of sense. Um, I think uh, she, in some ways, the one crucial part of her development is that she has become a mother, um, a mother to two children. And uh, of course, the naming of the firstborn as after her brother is an important way of bringing that memory back 
to Mr. Dombey because that Mr. Dombey's love insofar as he was capable of love at the beginning was for little Paul. Um, but I think that there's a maternal relationship between Florence and Mr. Dombey that goes with what you're saying, that her, her role as a mother and as someone, as a, as a woman who is now a mother, which gives her a different status in Victorian society than as an unmarried woman or as a, an old maid like Miss Tox, who, who lacks authority because she's, un, she's single. Um, that Florence, Florence does have a greater presence, a greater strength, and that some of that makes her into a, a mother figure for Mr. Dombey. So thank you. Robert? Yes, <clears throat> I think I think that uh, Charles Dickens is playing with our assumptions in this novel. Um, and it starts off with the little Paul. Uh, we think the novel is gonna be about this little boy growing up. We can see his personality and his dad's personality. And we can say, uh, it's not gonna have a happy ending right here. And then in the quarter of the way through the book, the boy dies. So <clears throat> there's our assumption is, well, what is the novel about now? Uh, I kind of related to the, to the movie, uh, Alfred Hitchcock's uh, uh, Psycho, where the, the main character dies early on. And the, and the audience is sitting there, well, what's this movie gonna be about now? So when we see the next part unfold, we think, oh, okay, this novel is about pride goeth before a fall. We're gonna see this great man fall. And it kind of follows that arc. And, and we see his rise and his fall and so forth. But um, the, real, the real moral of this story is grace, which is unmerited favor. So uh, Dombey does not deserve anything that he receives at the end. Uh, he doesn't deserve his uh, daughter's reconciliation and he definitely doesn't deserve uh, Harriet's money. Uh, Harriet has, you know, no reason to, to uh, care for, for Dombey. And here she's inherited a little bit of money and she finds a way to kind of slip it uh, into uh, Mr. Dombey's uh, pocket without him knowing it. And uh, that's cer certainly nothing that, that Dombey deserves. Uh, so if you reread the first three quarters of the book, and, and say to yourself, this is a novel about grace, about uh, un, unmerited favor and so forth, then the whole thing is kind of streamlined because then the, the first uh, three quarters kind of makes sense because that's really what it is about. The grace part doesn't really show up to the end, but um, it runs as a thread all the way through. That's that's very nice, and I'm glad you mentioned the um, the the money that comes from Harriet that uh, actually began with uh, her brother, not her brother. Yes, her brother James. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the money that she and John Carker get from James Carker, who dies intestate, that is without a, without a will, and so under the law of the time is the closest of kin, the next of kin, uh, they would receive whatever monies uh, were in his estate. And then for what reason other than, as you call it, grace. Grace, right. So even meeting with Edith, I, I'm, I have a feeling deep inside that she knows that she's going to um, be meeting Edith because who else would it be? I mean, the fact that Walter is so secretive about the whole uh, uh, the whole trip in general and so forth. It almost uh, leads uh, points directly to Edith, and the fact that she's willing to to uh, to meet with Edith uh, shows a certain amount of grace. And Edith, ha her character hasn't really changed, so Edith has to respond in the way that Edith is is going to respond, even if she 
you know, gives gives an inch or two. She she remains um, Edith all the way uh, to the end. But uh, when it comes to uh, Florence uh, talking to her father, uh, she can't walk into that situation and say, "I forgive you," because uh, how would Mr. Dombey look at it like that? He'd have to admit that uh, he was a terrible person, and by saying, "Can you forgive me?" then it's it's a it's a totally different situation on his part he if he says yes i can forgive you then immediately they can have a relationship and immediately he he hasn't lost his his pride or uh his past behavior is not in question and so forth and immediately from that point on they can have a a, a relationship and the, the the past is forgotten so um, I, don't, I think that that's the, really the only way she could have handled that situation, whether it was, it was right or wrong, or if that was what she felt, uh, she gave him an opportunity to save face and have a relationship with her with, without any reservations. Does, just one, one question. I mean, th that too seems to me a very interesting and persuasive case for, the course of events. I, I still don't think that Florence consciously knows she's uh, going to meet Edith. Um, the, the text doesn't seem to me to, uh, to, to support that. But is, is Florence offering some kind of grace to Edith? Uh, no, I think, I think uh, uh, Edith is still a proud woman and she's unwilling to uh, She's unwilling to admit her fault in the relationship uh, because she knows Mr. Dombey will never admit to his fault in the relationship. But they both knew who the other was. They both understood each other's character when they entered in that marriage and so forth. So uh, I don't think there was going to ever be uh, any kind of rec reconciliation on, on that on that ground right there. He treated um, her badly. She treated him badly. She felt like it was, it was a, a fair exchange. I think she does acknowledge that they, sh you know, they should never have married. Uh -huh. um, and so, in that in that sense, it was the responsibility for the failed marriage lay with both of them and lay w with the structures larger than the two individuals. They lay with, uh, um, with what we would call patriarchy. But I think you know that. She submitted to it by going on the marriage market, and he certainly didn't question it because he thought it was his right as a, uh, uh, as a man and as a, uh, a wealthy man. But I still feel that Florence is not doing a kindness to, to Edith at the end by um, putting words of apology in Edith's mouth that Edith cannot speak without well, losing even at that her. time she's thinking at that time she's thinking more of her father and what he would like to hear and uh she's going to do that on on her father's behalf to try to get as much uh of an apology as she can which is something uh edith is not willing to do and from my perspective good for edith that she's mm -hmm. not willing to do yes no uh, yeah so anyway, thank you for, for, the, for that. I think those are, those are very good insights. Iker? Hello. So um, I'm very glad to be here because uh, the characters, um, the last quarter was um, such a jumble and the first three quarters, I just loved so much. So I was a little disappointed. And then um, to see Florence grovel to this man that struck her um, was just awful. To a, a modern woman, I would say, your reaction is just, no, 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 dear. No, no, no. I, you know, if it were today, they'd need family counseling, I suppose. Um, and then the, um, I, I ended up really not liking Florence at all. 
um, and seeing her as a, a cardboard cutout, kind of uh, something Dickens needed to create. Um, and her, her meeting with Edith, I liked Edith so much more. Um, I really admired Edith, very articulate woman and uh, knew, knew herself and knew what was going on. And she wasn't going to do what the child um, um, asked. So um, I'd just like to say two more things. Let's see. Oh, the scene where Mr. Carker is um, it dies is the most incredible writing, some of the most incredible writing I've ever read. Um, that was so worth <laughs> reading. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that a few nights ago, I started reading A Christmas Carol again. And I went, oh no, it's another Dombey. <laughs> anyway, so that's all I have to say, except thank you. You're helping me so much to uh, enrich this experience. Thank you, Tiger. And this, lots of excellent comments from members of the group. So please continue. Irene? Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you. I want to comment again on this scene between Florence and Edith, uh, because I find it very, un well, expected but unsatisfactory, because I think it shows that Florence has not changed at all. She's totally su the subservient daughter, uh, and all she can do here is try to get the best she can for her father. And yet, you know, she loves this woman. She's been the best mother to her. And yet look what happens when the, uh, the beginning of it, she doesn't just say mama, she falls back horrified that she's having to meet this woman again, that she's having to meet someone that her conventional upbringing says is a fallen woman and that she shouldn't be having anything to do with. So it's a totally uncharitable way in which she's meeting Edith there. And you can see that also in her almost demand that Edith should apologize to the father and yet she knows how badly Edith has been treated by her father. So I just find her whole attitude towards Edith in this scene so conventional and so unsatisfactory for that reason. This idea that a fallen woman is, is so horrific that uh, she has no place in society. Uh, she's no, you know, so that Florence doesn't even consider the possibility that, they, that uh, her father could be reconciled and that Edith could be reestablished. That, Society would never allow that, so Florence can't accept it either. So I, I just find this scene uh, not surprising, but really horrific as showing, in, to some extent, Dickens' view of society, uh, that he's siding with the conventional view here of the, the, of the way that Edith has behaved or appears to have behaved, and that therefore she is you know, unacceptable within that society. And I'll just finish by saying that um, I think that what happened, it's not made clear, but I think she continues, she returns to France because there the attitude to sexual relationships was even at that time very different. And she would have been able to have a better life there than she ever could by returning to the UK, returning to England. I, I think she ends up in Italy, actually. Or I mean, Italy, yeah, probably yeah. there also. <laughs> 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 the, the attitudes to sex, very different. Uh, and to, you know, to, to women who have broken away from their husbands. Um, Fl Florence does uh, snuggle with Edith. She does use, uh, you know, she puts her head on Edith's bosom. Uh, she, she uses, uh, you know, you, you could say that that's, that's part of the manipulation that, uh, that she's using. Uh, but I think if you read it that way, that uh, she's not treating Edith as a fallen woman, but she's, um, and saying that she's, well, she may, from a conventional perspective, be unacceptable in England. But what Florence is trying to get from Edith is that reconciliation. She wants to bring her into the, um, the, the domain of, 
of the father. She wants to bring her into patriarchy. I, I don't see that because I don't see her expecting Edith to ever be in the presence of uh, her father again. She simply Not, wants to bring a message of forgiveness yeah. uh, from Edith, or beg your pardon, an appeal for forgiveness from Edith to her father to help her father not anything of benefit to Edith that I can see but because of that you know I'm not saying that she rejects her completely she on the contrary she does that you know she would say uh a start you know accept the, her relationship with Edith and her willingness to to spend time with Edith but she doesn't see her as someone that could be part of her family background now or that her father could ever accept back again. She simply wants to make her father's life easier with an apology from Edith, rather than looking to see what might be of benefit to Edith. In, in talking about Dickens's attitudes, I think we have to remember that Dickens is the one who created Edith with all of the strength and mm -hmm. force that, that she exhibits in the novel. So. But he no, doesn't anywhere in the novel suggest that a woman like Edith can ever have a place in society, despite the fact that he himself broke, broke all the conventional codes <laughs> in the way in which he behaved towards women. But Alice Marwood, who is a former prostitute, has to die. And Edith does not have to die. If, if this, you know, one, one logic would say that she has to be sent off in shame, and she doesn't go off in shame. She goes off in exile. Um, so, but don't forget, she wasn't guilty. As she, she hasn't is. committed as, adultery and never as, intended as, to, <laughs> and that makes a difference in the philosophy of the uh, of the guilt of the you know relationship. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, though. Thank you, <laughs> Ted. Yeah, I, I think with e both Edith and Florence, it's it's a matter for each of them individually to maintain a certain integrity, and they're the 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 two of them have different senses of in integrity, and I especially like the character of Edith because she's this unusually poorly suited uh, woman to be a trophy wife. Uh, she's brought up to be basically for sale uh, by her mother and uh, very beautiful but those the compliments to her beauty kind of grate on her because ultimately she's to to be married off and it grates on her every step of the way she's described as proud but in, in a way i i sense that uh, edith is uh, it, it's more it's less about pride and more indignation about her lot in life so finally, when she runs off um, and, and makes it as far as France, but no further, I, I think part of her sense of integrity is that that um, her, her her lot in life to be married off does not mean that she's a, a double crosser, double uh, uh, betraying Dombey any further. Just trying to get her her sense of integrity was to get out of uh, an, an unfortunate marriage that she felt she was forced into, but not in uh, the sense of being a betrayer. And in the case of Florence, I, I think her, she, her sense of integrity and duty to her father means that running off and getting married against his will or without his approval was was potentially a betrayal of him, which is why she's, she's begging for his forgiveness. And, and why Florence would also want Edith to beg for forgiveness too. It's a, it's a mismatch among, uh, between the two of them about what's, what's the right thing to do. Um, one thing about Carker's death, that cha that's a chapter that reminds me of Little Dorrit uh, about nine years later, um, the master of the Marshall Sea uh, at the end of his life uh, in a demented state has this amazing and rather uh, vertiginous uh, trip in which he's he feels pursued and just go, goes off his rocker essentially and finally that leads to his death it was a very similar thing uh, a very strange trip in which they're they're um, they're traveling physically but also mentally 
becoming unhinged and leading to a, a death scene. Uh, but, but those are two one-chapter death scenes uh, that, that in, embody a, a traveling uh, theme. The earliest version of that, that motif in Dickens is Bill Sykes in Oliver Twist, who after the murder of Nancy uh, feels haunted by, in his case, the dog whose eyes resemble the eyes of, uh, of Nancy, the woman he has killed. And it's all narrated from the perspective of, the, uh, of Sykes who is pursued. And it's, it's, it's a motif that, that Dickens uses on other occasions very powerfully and very successfully, I think, because it creates the interior psychology of a guilty criminal. We have other people. Hi, Glenna. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to make a couple of comments. First of all, I'm glad you brought up the fact that um, Florence proposes to Walter, because even though there's a class difference, it's so unusual in Victorian novels. It, when you said that, it made me think of all the. I I also love Trollope novels. Absolutely. Not quite as much as Dickens, but Trollope has so many women that, oh my God, you have to go through all this to do, you know, they really love the guy, but they can't even after he's proposed, you know, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, get with it, get with it. So this is completely different. Um, and I, I think it's very interesting that you brought up how the structure of patriarchy uh, forecloses uh, options for uh particularly for Edith. And what I want to point out is, as a historian to women, in the 19th century, a woman had very few things to do to support herself, um, you know, governess. Um, and if she was of Edith's class, she couldn't be a, a, a nurse. She couldn't run a dame school very, very easily. So women uh, go on the marriage market quite literally because it's their only option. And uh, it's a brutal system to women. Um, Edith Wharton has some novels that also deal with this theme. What is it, The Custom of the Country? I think it is. Um, anyhow, it's, it's, it's a theme that is um, based in very real um, constraints that women faced. And the final thing I wanna say is that this conversation this discussion has helped me understand what I find disquieting about the scene between Edith and, um, and Florence, because Florence is functioning within the patriarchy. And I think showing sparks of, uh, you know, real, real spunk, but in that scene, she's an instrument of the patriarchy. And that does not um, comport with other parts of her character, I think. And that, that's why I find that, now I understand that's why I found that scene so troubling. So thank you. Um, I'll say thank you for that. That's, and I, I like your distinction at the end that uh, she is an instrument within patriarchy and Edith stands outside of patriarchy at that point. Not completely because she's still dependent financially on Cousin Phoenix, but Cousin Phoenix is not a typical patriarch. Um, um, but I'll say one, one other thing, your, your comment about Florence, uh, Florence's agency reminds me of one other thing that she does, which is extremely unconventional, which is that she sails on a ship to China with her husband on board ship as a married woman. You know, that, uh, that's, that's pretty daring uh, for her. I mean, it, it, it's not unheard of for women to travel on commercial ships, but uh, but still, it's uh, for Florence, that's a big leap from what we have seen of her prior to this. One other thing I wanted to point out, if I may, um, obviously the railroad is a big issue, but then there's the budding technology that isn't part of this novel. And as it happened, <clears throat> I happened to look up the exact date when um, the telegraph was invented. And it was the 
message that um, Samuel Morse sent via Morse code, what half God wrought was 1844, which is exactly when Dickens is writing this novel. Had it been set a few years later, <laughs> then uh, somebody could have telegraphed uh, <laughs> Carker in Dijon and said, whoops, you better watch out. <laughs> um, you know, are there are there other people in the queue, Courtney? There are. Okay. okay. Um, so Karen, Maxine, and Martha. So yeah, Karen, I'll Karen. I'll try I'll try to make this um, fast. But I just think back to Edith. This is a remarkable character, and this chapter and the scene I think is a strong um, feminist chapter. You know. It's an extremely important indictment of non-repentance on the part of Dombey, Edith holding him accountable, which I think is incredibly important. Um, he has to repent for her to forgive him. She refuses to be a victim. She refuses to accept guilt without him also accepting that. And there's a paragraph on 940 that I think if we go back to it after this ends, it's just an incredible paragraph. I used every colored pen I had to mark it, <laughs> where, where, you know, she says, repentant of his own part in the dark vision of our married life. At that time, I will be repentant too. I mean, there's a joint accountability, and this is incredible to be recognized at this time. So that was my comment. Thank you. Maxine, uh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, is that better? Also on Edith, when, you, when we meet her in the novel, she is a degraded character in her own eyes. She feels she's a prostitute that has been pimped out by her mother. Her relationship to uh, Florence is an altruistic relationship. She really loves her. It's a sincere feeling and she wants to protect her and she's willing to sacrifice for her. So in the scene between them, yes, she would like Florence to love her, but the more important thing is that she feels self-respect for her entire relationship with Florence. And that, that's what enables her to uh, maintain her stance. Good, thank you. Martha? Can you hear me? Yep. I find um, Edith just an outstanding character and I really appreciate um, the last couple of comments there. Um, um, I'm wondering if I have her wrong. I see her going to Italy and having the life that she wants to have, not the one that's been thrown on her all her life. Do I have that wrong? <laughs> I, I, I think we don't know. Uh, we, we can't say for sure, um, but each, each reader, I think, is allowed to imagine what her future holds for her. Uh, one of the other things that happens in some Victorian novels and that actually begins in uh, Sir Walter Scott is that the, the dark heroine, um, who's always more sexual than the blonde heroine and who uh, exists outside of matrimony, um, leaves the country of origin, which is usually England, goes to the continent, which is uh, a freer place for women and has different attitudes towards female sexuality. And um, but sometimes ends up in a convent because, uh, you know, th that's sort of going from one jail into another jail, though you could say it's a community of women um, as opposed to patriarchy. But uh, anyway, it's, it's a convention that the dark woman has to go into exile and what form the exile takes when Becky Sharp goes to, um, Europe in Vanity Fair, she has a lot of fun. Um, so uh, it, it can, you know, there, there are different possibilities and we don't know enough to say for sure in this novel. Um, 
we're we're almost out of time, and I I, I wanted to um, well we are out of time, but uh, ask you to think about toots at the end because I think that one of the really successful things in this novel is the character of Toots. And some people have argued that the best marriage in all of Dickens's novels is the marriage between Toots and Susan Nipper. Yeah. Uh, sure. And if you, if you think about uh, the wedding of Walter and Florence, and before the wedding, there's the reading of the bands, which is the public announcement that a marriage will take place in a in a given length of time. Uh, it's really interesting to see Toots's reaction to the reading of the of the bands. Um, but anyway, I love Mr. Toots, and Mr. Toots uh, is, I think, one of the. Um, real achievements of this novel. Yes. Thank you all so much. This has been a very stimulating conversation. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. And um, thank you for being here. If, if you're interested in being part of the Dickens Fellowship uh, that will be a, a branch located at Santa Cruz, uh, let Courtney know. And um, uh, again, thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much. Mm -hmm. Wonderful.